In today's lecture, we give an introduction to the framework of M estimation. Up to this point, that is in our previous lectures, we've talked about linear models for cross-section or panel data and how you would estimate them. All of these estimators were in some sense uh, linear or relied on the assumptions of linearity, which allowed, uh, allowed us to derive them in closed form. We now enter a completely different territory, namely the territory of nonlinear estimation methods. So the plan for the next couple of lectures, the next three, four, five lectures, goes as follows. We'll talk about the framework of M estimation in detail, where today we give an introduction and also illustrate the ideas of M estimation in the context of nonlinear least squares. We'll then later on move on to talking about the asymptotic properties of M estimators in more detail, as well as how you do inference with these types of estimators. Then three lectures down the road, we'll talk about the maximum likelihood method of estimation in more detail as well, where we cover all of these and we'll see that various results for maximum likelihood estimation may be understood within the framework of M estimation. So the plan for today's lecture, the remainder of the lecture, goes as follows. First, I'll talk about some general themes for nonlinear estimation, as well as econometric analysis overall. Then I'll introduce the notion of nonlinear regression, as well as nonlinear nonlinear least squares and then move on to talking about the uh, general framework of M estimation. So first of all, a couple of comments on the chapters of nonlinear estimation. So I think it's fair to say that Woltrich chapters 12 and 13 on M estimation as well as maximum likelihood estimation are rather abstract and technical. In these lectures, we try to give a somewhat non-technical focus. I do want to stress, though, that there is that it can be um, very useful to work with this abstract and somewhat technical setting, in that we can rely on the generality later on. Specifically, in the next couple of lectures, we'll we'll derive a unified framework for understanding estimation and the associated methods of inference, and the framework that we derive will be rich enough to encompass both the, met, the ordinary least squares estimator, the nonlinear least squares estimator that we're looking at today, as well as estimators that we may encounter down the road, such as all types of maximum likelihood estimators, and also other more exotic types of estimators, such as the method of least absolute deviations. I do want to stress, though, that there'll be no exam questions in these two chapters specifically, but they are both important as well as very much required background knowledge for the chapters to follow. At this point, I think it might be helpful to go over, go over the various steps in econometric analysis or remind ourselves of these steps. Now, Overall, there are three umbrella steps in econometric analysis. One concerns identification, another estimation, and then inference. Now, when we ask ourselves to question ourselves the question of identification, we're asking ourselves the question, if we were given the distribution of model observables, that is the joint distribution of observable variables in our model, would we be able to recover the parameters of interest? And to some extent, if so, how? Now, if we are able to recover these parameters of interest in the best possible scenario, that is, where we have the distribution of observables available, then it makes sense to consider the question of estimation. However, if we're not able to, recover the parameters in this hypothetical best case scenario, then estimation is hopeless. But let's suppose for the moment that we are able to recover the parameters in the best case scenario, then the estimation question is about 
if we're given a random sample, that is, we're, we're granted less, a less rich setting than in the question of identification, but if we're given a random sample, how would we be able, how would we construct parameter estimates? And building on the estimation step, we might be a, we might be searching for methods to do inference, which could cover both, say, constructing confidence intervals or intervals for various types of predictions, as well as hypothesis testing and so forth. Now let's discuss these couple of steps, or these three steps, in a bit more detail. Now, since the question of identification concerns this hypothetical scenario where we have access to the distribution of model observables, it really has nothing to do with the sample. It is a question that solely concerns the population. On the other hand, or contrary to this, the estimation step is very much sample reliant. And this question is really about, or one may think about this question as asking what sort of formula or more generally, what sort of algorithm should I use in combination with my data in order to construct parameter estimates. Now the inference step typically requires some sort of distribution theory. And in this class, we'll be very much reliant on asymptotic distribution theory. Now these steps are very much interdependent. That is, without identification, estimation is really a hopeless task. On the other hand, the method for identification may be in itself suggestive of an estimator. If that's the case, often we'll refer to such a setting as yielding constructive identification constructive in the sense of suggesting an estimator. Lastly, steps two and three are very much linked in that the a method for obtaining valid inference hinges on the exact estimation method that we've employed. Now let's move on to talking about the topic of nonlinear regression. So a nonlinear regression model arises from the following components. We have an outcome variable, which we for now take as scalar and denote by y. We have a vector of k explanatory variables, x. And now as, a, as our model for the conditional mean of y given x, we use this m function, where m is a function of x and candidate parameters, let's call them theta, belonging to some parameter space, capital theta, which is just some subset of the p-dimensional Euclidean space. Now we'll say that the model, or our mean, conditional mean model, is correctly specified if for some value, some candidate parameter, let's call it theta naught, the conditional mean of y given x is exactly given by our model thereof at theta naught. So this is, by this equation, or this equality, we mean that it holds for all possible realizations of x. Now this theta naught value yielding correct specification we will refer to as the true value of theta. At this point, it may be helpful to give a couple of specific examples of what this m function might be. So let's look at a couple of functional forms. Now suppose that the outcome that we're trying to model the mean of is actually a non-negative variable, say income or something like that then in order to ensure non-negativity of the conditional mean as well, or our model thereof, we may use as our m function, say, 
the exponential function to the inner product of x and the candidate parameter, say theta. Since we're using exponentiation, it makes sense to refer to such a model for the conditional mean as an exponential regression model. As another example, let's suppose that the outcome y is in fact a bounded random variable. And let's just consider the case where it's bounded between 0 and 1 for simplicity. So more generally, this example here is for bounded y. If it's bounded between 0 and 1, then it may make sense to use as our m function the logistic function, logistic in the inner product of x and candidate parameters theta. So this here is the logistic function at x theta. Now, since we use the logistic function to model the conditional mean of y given x, often such a setting is referred to as a logistic regression model. Now, in these two examples, we had that the number of explanatory variables, k, was equal to the number of candidate parameters, p. But in general, nothing prevents k and p from being Nothing prevents k from exceeding p or the other way around. Both scenarios are included in our general nonlinear regression framework. Now, our previous regression models have been formulated using an error formulation, and we can do something similar in our nonlinear regression setting. So, let's assume that the model is in fact correctly specified which we'll actually assume throughout this lecture. In Woolrich, this assumption is denoted by NLS1, where NLS is short for nonlinear least squares, but more on that later when we talk about estimation. Now, if the model is correctly specified, then we could define the difference between the outcome and our model of the conditional mean thereof at the true parameter. As we can give that a name, Let's call it u. And we can, simply by rearranging this expression, express the outcome that we're modeling as the sum of two components, namely our model for its conditional mean at the true parameter, up to some, some unobservable u, which has conditional mean zero. Now this u is unobservable because Although it hinges on the observables, y and x, it also depends on the true parameter, theta naught, which we do not know. In fact, that's the parameter that we're trying to learn. Now, I want to stress at this point that u having conditional mean zero is a consequence of our earlier model for the conditional mean of y. It's not an additional assumption. It's a consequence of what we've already assumed. Now, this type of error formulation, it's, while it's not really used that often for a nonlinear regression setting, it'll be useful, mostly useful later on, for abbreviating expressions such as, say, asymptotic variances, which we'll look into in the next lecture. Now, what have we assumed and what have we not assumed up to this point? Now, in our error formulation of the model, u having conditional mean zero was implied. What is not implied is that the unobservable u and the explanatory variables x are independent, which is in general not true. The only thing that's implied is that the conditional mean of u given x does not depend on x, which is to say that u and x are mean independent. For example, if we look at the conditional variance of u given x, it may be non-constant or otherwise, or, which is to say that it may depend on x in a non-trivial manner, 
that is, it is a non-degenerate function of x, which we often refer to as heteroscedasticity. In our specific example, where we were dealing with an, a non-negative outcome, just by definition of u, we may rearrange non-negative negativity of y to see that the unobservable u must be at least minus our model for the conditional mean at the true parameters. Now, since, since the possible values that u can take on hinges on x in general, these two variables cannot be independent. It is simply ruled out. That is, we cannot even assume it in general. Now, what this error formulation of our nonlinear regression model yields is a what we may term a semi-parametric model for the distribution of y given x. Why semi-parametric? Well, first of all, we've written down a parametric model for, for the conditional mean of y given x, which is one particular feature of the distribution of y given x, but not necessarily a feature which completely pins down this distribution. We haven't specified a parametric distribution for y or for u given x, and hence not for y given x altogether. For example, we have not specified a model for the for the conditional variance of y given x, and therefore not its entire distribution. Since we've parametrically specified parts or features of the model of a distribution of y given x, but not the distribution itself, it makes sense to call the model semi-parametric. Now let's move on to discussing the first step in econometric analysis in the context of nonlinear regression. That is, let's discuss the topic of identification. Now, as we'll show in a couple of slides, or over the course of a number of slides, we'll show that this true value of theta, theta naught, is in fact the solution to a certain population problem, or PP for short. This problem is the problem of minimizing the expected square difference between our outcome and our model for its conditional mean, where minimization takes place over the possible parameterizations of the conditional mean. Now, in our treatment here of nonlinear regression, we're thinking of the function m as being known to us. It's something in our control. And similarly, we're thinking of this parameter space, capital theta, as being something that we know. So since both the model m and the parameter space are known quantities to us, the following hypothetical makes sense. Or well, the following hypothetical is, is of interest. Namely, if we were given the joint distribution of y and x, our model observables, then the population problem, we, in our population problem, we have knowledge of both m, capital theta, and this expectation, right? Since this expectation relates to y and x. So under, in the hypothetical setting where we're given the distribution of observables, the population problem is a known quantity. Since we have for now argue, or for now taken as given, and as we'll argue in a moment, that the true value of the parameters, theta naught, solves this problem, what we need to do in order to recover theta naught from the population problem is to show that no other parameter can solve this problem, which is to say that the, prop, the population problem solution is unique. If that's the case, 
then we'll refer to, or we, we have established, that the true theta is identified. That is, theta naught is identified if the population problem has a unique solution. So, we've previously taken as given here that theta naught solves the population problem. Now let's actually show how the argument goes. That is, let's establish this claim. So the starting point here is to say, let's take just some arbitrary per candidate parameter, theta, from our parameter space, and let's look at the square difference between our outcome and our model for its conditional mean. I take this inside the square, let's add and subtract the conditional, the model for the conditional mean at the true parameter, that is at theta naught. So that's what's going on inside the curly brackets here. Now add and subtracting, I can associate one of these M, M values at the true thetas with the outcome and one with our model at the candidate theta. Now I can open up the square that is expanded and I'll get the square of this term and this term minus the cross product. The square of the first term is here and the of the second is here and in Writing out the cross product, I've, in, I've recalled our definition of u as the difference between the outcome and our model for its conditional mean at the true parameter, the true theta. It's just a convenient way of writing this cross product. All right. Now, if we take expectations over the left-hand side, and distribute it onto each of the three right-hand side components, we get the following displayed equation. The left-hand side is simply the expectation of the, of the, of the previous left-hand side, and at the right-hand side we have the expectation over the first term on the right-hand side, and the second on the right-hand side. Now the third drops out, by an argument using iterated expectations. Specifically, if we look at the expectation of the third term after factoring out constants, we see that we can write, we can calculate this expectation in two steps. First, calculate the expectation of u given x, in which case the term in squared brackets factors out since it only depends on x. So conditioning on x, we can treat it as a constant. And now we see that since we are dealing with the conditional mean of u given x in the first expectation, and this thing is a zero, the whole thing must in fact be zero, which is why I didn't include it on the right-hand side. <laughs> All right, so on the previous slide, we established that the expected square difference between our outcome and our model for the conditional mean thereof at some current candidate parameter theta can be expressed as the sum of two terms. One is the exact same expression, except that I've replaced our candidate parameter with a true parameter. And the second is the expected square difference between the two models for the conditional mean. Now note here that the left-hand side is just the population criterion function or the population minimum, the thing we're trying to minimize, at theta. And the right-hand side is the population criterion function at theta naught up to some term where the term that I'm referring to is the expected square difference between our two models for the conditional mean. Now, since this second term is the expectation of something squared, 
since squaring yields a non-negative number and taking an expectation preserves the sign, the whole thing must be non-negative. But this means that the population criterion at theta naught must be at most the population criterion function at theta. Now since this whole, since our choice of theta candidate parameter was completely arbitrary, we've shown that the true value of theta cannot yield a population criterion that's larger, or has to yield a value of the population criterion, which is as small as it can possibly be over the parameter space, which is to say that the true value of theta solves this population problem. Now this argument, as just established, shows that theta naught is indeed a solution to the population problem, but it doesn't establish uniqueness. So now let's look, look at the problem of establishing uniqueness. All right, so here, let's, let us just recap. What we've shown is that the population criterion function or population minimum at any theta is equal to the population minimum at the true value of theta plus a term describing the expected difference, or expected squared difference between our two models for the conditional mean. We've previously used this to argue that the true value of theta is a minimizer of the population problem. But it also tells us more. Namely, if we're looking at a candidate theta, which is not the true theta. And this expected squared difference between our two models for the conditional mean is positive for all such candidate thetas, which is not equal to the true parameter. Then theta naught, the true parameter, must indeed be not only a solution, but the unique solution to the population problem. That is to say, theta naught, this should be an O, uniquely solves the population problem if and only if the second term is strictly positive for any theta different from the true parameter. Now this condition we'll refer to as our identification condition for nonlinear regression. Next, we'll look at the question of when does this identification condition fail? As our first example of, a, uh, of an identification failure or identification success, let's look at our dear old friend, namely the linear regression model. Now we started out saying that we've moved on to the, we started out this lecture talking about how we've moved on to a nonlinear setting. So it may be a bit weird to look at the linear regression model, but nonetheless, it'll be instructive for illustrating a possible identification failure. Now in the case of the linear regression model, our M function is simply the inner product between X and theta, which are therefore of same length. Now the second term from our previous slide, that is the expected square difference between our two models for the conditional mean, can in this case, by substituting for this inner product, be written as the expected square of x times the difference between the two parameters, two parameterizations. Now we can write this square by opening up the square, we can write it as a, the expectation over a quadratic form. And if we pull the expectation inside until it hits something random, we get the latter quadratic form, which sandwiches the expected outer product of the regressors by the difference in parameterizations. Now our identification conditions 
condition tells us that this expression must be positive for all theta different than the true theta. That is all theta in our parameter space. Now we know that this expected outer product of the regressors is a positive semi-definite matrix and it'll be which ensures that the right hand side here is non-negative. Well, we already knew that from looking at our original expression, but this just confirms our calculations thus far or helps check our calculations thus far. So, but in order to ensure that this expression is strictly positive, when we are looking at a non-zero difference between the two parameterizations, we need, it is sufficient as well as necessary that the matrix, the expected outer product of the regressors is positive definite. Well, such a, such a matrix is positive definite or a positive semi-definite matrix is positive definite if and only if it has full rank. So in this case, our identification condition simply boils down to our usual rank condition for least squares. Next, we move on to a model which is inherently nonlinear. In this case, we look at a nonlinear regression model where our m function is, well, linear in the parameters theta1 and theta2, as well as theta3, but nonlinear in the parameters due to the dependence on the third regressor through exponentiation with some parameter. Let's call it theta4. Now let's consider a specific case where the true value of the third parameter, theta0,3, is in fact zero which is to say that the true conditional mean, assuming a well-specified model, the true conditional mean is in fact linear, since it, since it just boils down to the sum of the first two components here. Now, what does this mean for the question of identification? Well, we've already established that the true, the true value of theta minimizes the population or solves the population problem but let's look at something that's different from the true value of theta. In particular, let's look at a candidate parameter, let's say theta, which has as its third component zero. Or specifically, let's look at a theta. Now, if, if we look at such a theta where the third component is zero, then we see that the criterion function no longer depends on theta four. Hence, if we look at a theta, which is exactly the true value of theta one and two, and then zero, and then some constant, let's say C, such just some real number, such that th this theta vector is in fact part of the parameter space. In that case, this theta must also be a minimizer or a solution to the population problem. So we see that for this particular nonlinear regression model, where the true value of theta three is zero, identification fails. That is, there are multiple solutions to the population problem. This particular example of a nonlinear regression model therefore serves as an example of a poorly identified model. Having discussed the first step in econometric analysis, namely identification, we next proceed to the second step, that is estimation. Now let's assume, let's assume that identification of theta naught holds, that is theta naught is now assumed to be the unique solution to the population problem, which is to say it is the arcmin of this population minimum. 
Now, next, at this point, since we've characterized or recovered theta naught, the true value of theta, as the unique solution to some population problem involving an expectation, we may invoke the analogy principle in order to come up with an estimator. In this case, the analogy principle suggests replacing this population expectation with a sample average, and we arrive at the sample problem where we seek to minimize the average squared difference between our outcome and our conditional mean thereof. And minimization still takes place over various candidate parameters. That is, we search through our parameter space, capital theta. Now, per analogy with our identification result, or which at this point holds by assumption, per analogy with our identification, we may refer to any solution to this sample problem as our estimator of theta naught. And since this sample problem is a minimize the sum of squares or average of squares type of problem, we refer to such an estimator or such a solution as a nonlinear least squares estimator or NLS for short. At this point, we're simply assuming that a solution to the sample problem exists, although it may not be unique. A very much relevant question when it comes to estimation is whether or not our estimator or sequence of estimators is consistent for the parameter that we're trying to estimate. In our case, the question therefore is, does nonlinear least squares consistently estimate the true parameter of theta, or the true value of theta? We'll look more into this in later vid videos, but at this point, we can say that, well, the answer is yes, provided the following conditions hold. First, we need theta naught to be identified, as it only makes sense, with the analogy principle is only reasonable, if we've truly characterized theta naught as a unique solution. So our first condition is that theta naught is identified. Our second condition relates the sample criterion function, or sample minimum, to the population equivalent. And what we'll assume, and later on look, take a closer look at, is that the sample minimum converges to the population equivalent in a suitable sense. So here, the arrow indicating convergence of the sample minimum to the population minimum is only understood up to this point as a heuristic convergence. We'll later on discuss exactly in, one se in what sense we mean that this convergence takes place. Having gone through this example of nonlinear regression and nonlinear least squares, we'll look into the problem of consistency in more detail, having introduced our more general setting. So that's what we'll do next. Next, we introduce the framework of M estimation, starting with our target of estimation, or what's known as our M estimate. We now venture into the a setting which is more abstract. And in this setting, we'll need a function known as the Q function, which depends on two quantities, namely a random vector W, representing model observables, for example, y and x, if we want to divide our model observables into, say, an outcome and explanatory variables thereof. 
and the second component being model parameters, which we still represent by theta. In, the, in this abstract setting, we assume that there is a true parameter theta naught, which is now simply assumed to be the unique solution to the population problem. That is, theta naught is the unique arcmin, where the thing we're trying to minimize, the population minimum, is the expectation over Q, expectation being with respect to W, all model observables, and we minimize over candidate parameters as represented by the parameter space, capital theta. Since we're conducting minimization in defining our M estimate, the M may be thought of as being short for minimization. That is, it connotes minimization. Although it could also stand for maximization in the event where we're interested in the solution to some maximization problem, since we can always recast a maximization problem as a minimization problem by a sign change. Having our M estimate in place, we can talk about estimation. So let's assume access to a random sample of W's or WI's having N available. Again, the analogy principle suggests the following sample problem, where we minimize not the expected value of Q, but the average Q taking the average over the WIs in our sample. Minimization still taking place over the parameter space, or what we may think of as candidate thetas. Now, now we can define, we can define an M estimator of theta naught as being any solution to the sample problem or SP for short. Now this framework is somewhat abstract. So in order to make it less abstract, let's look at a couple of examples of M estimators, some, some being familiar and some that we will encounter later on. By taking as our Q function, Q of W and theta, the squared difference between our outcome and a the inner product of x and theta, we arrive at a least square setting and therefore the OLS estimator. If we replace this inner product by some potentially nonlinear function of x and theta and use this as our Q, we're brought back to the context of nonlinear regression and specifically the nonlinear least squares estimator. We may also think about a likelihood setting. That is, if we're thinking about a setting where y given x is a model where we are modeling the entire distribution of y given x up to some parameters, theta, and let, let's say that f represents the density of y given x for a candidate theta, then we can use as our q function the negative log likelihood, or the negative log of the density of y given x at a candidate parameter theta. If instead of using our squared error type of Q function, we could, we could, we could use the absolute error. And this leads us, and use of this Q leads us to what's known as the least absolute deviations estimator, or LAD for short. Now these are just examples of M estimators, and we could come up with many, many more and we'll encounter many, many more down the road. But certainly this illustrates that the framework of M estimation 
is quite rich. To further illustrate the scope of our framework, let's look at the possible types of data that we could allow, we could allow for. Now in this abstract vector of observables, WI, we could have either a scalar or possibly vector outcome. For example, when we're modeling one equation using one a single cross section, we're, we're led to having a scalar outcome variable yi. But if we have multiple equations of interest and a single cross section available, we would naturally have multiple outcomes and our outcome would be a vector. As a more concrete economic example, we may be interested in modeling the joint labor supply decision within a household involving, say, a wife and a husband, just to give them a cup, give them some labels. In this case, we would have two outcomes, one being the labor supply of the wife within the family or household, and the other being the labor supply of the husband within the same household. Of course. We've also seen multiple equations earlier on, except that we, we called it a one equation setting with panel data. Well, panel data settings may be understood as a multiple equation setting where the outcome that we're modeling is the outcome for the single equation stacked over time periods one through capital T. Now this, this slide shows that the M estimation framework and the formulation and types of models that we may capture within this framework is indeed very general. We'll next move on to talking about the properties of M estimators in more detail.